Okay guys, hello. Hello everyone, welcome to today's episode. The title is A World Made of Smaller Worlds. And so I thought of asking a very interesting question. How many worlds are there right now? And what does it mean that there is a world here? What does the word world mean? And I'm going to read for you a definition that starts from... I'm going to read for you what Saint Dictionary has to say. <laughs> but uh, I'm also going to tell you my view um, or a, a, a different way of approaching it as well. So when we look at the definition of world, okay? So guys, it has a lot of ways it can be used. So as a noun, usually the world, the earth, together with all of its countries, peoples, and natural features. So our world means uh, our humanity. It can mean that. The world, all of the people, societies, and institutions on earth. Uh, another example is denoting one of the most important and influential people or things of its class. They have been brought up to re regard France as a world power. Another planet like the Earth, uh, the material universe or all that exists. So literally the definition of the world, this is a good definition, the material universe or all that exists. You know, <clears throat> so technically world means everything. A part or aspect, this is the second way of a uh, second definition, a part or aspect of human life or of the natural features of the earth in particular, a region or group of countries, a period of history, a group of living things, for example, the animal world, the ancient world, the English speaking world, these are examples of the dictionary scale. The people, places and activities to do with a particular thing, they were a legend in the world of British theater. <laughs> Human and social interaction, so it can even be perceived. See, these are all the various lenses, I guess you can <coughs> see. Uh, fee at, at, you know, it, it's like we don't only have the definition of words, uh, how we kind of like what they mean. It's also the emotion you had when you uh, when your mind kind of accepted meaning in phenomena. So guys, I'm just going to run down this list um, of the definitions. Human and social interaction, this that's one way of seeing the world. Average, respectable, fashionable people or their customs or opinions. One's world, a person's life and activities. Everything that exists outside of oneself. That could be a world too. You know, that means we technically don't perhaps identify with the inner realm as a world. But I, I call it a realm. It's a realm. A stage of human life, either mortal or after de death, in this world and the next. And in secular interests and affairs, secular, the world or in the church. Yeah. So guys, the, wor the, the word, world, the noun, has multiple meanings. <clears throat> but the way I want to use it was that I was listening to an Alan Watt lecture, this was years ago, and he was making this incredible point that the word atomus, which we, which uh, is the derivation of the word atom, it comes from to cut, to cut something, do you know? And so really our attempt to exploring the world has not per se been exploring its true nature, but has been to cut it up. So we saw one world, then like a piece of cake, we, 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 we kind of cut it up in pieces and we're like, all right, you have a piece of the world, you have a piece of the world, you know, someone with the candle on, uh, you know, on that part of the cake where the candle's on, you have a piece of the <laughs> <coughs> So that's the thing, that 
when we went to see what the atom was, was that we, in some sense, broke the world and to see what's inside. And the concept of constantly seeing what's inside can be an endless regression in the same dimension if everything is happening at once. The world <clears throat> is made of smaller worlds, you know, and we're not even necessarily smaller. It's just the world is made of worlds. There's two simultaneous angles. I can see the organs of my body separate or I can see them all as one functional body. We broke up the atom and we discovered, in some sense, uh, subatomic particles, you know. And so that was a very fascinating point because whether we broke the atom or we went further in the sky, we saw the new. And for me, really, the world is what comes to you in uh, a new. It, it, it's, it, there's novelty. Novelty is the most important force. That means if whoever you are, if you're a parent hearing what I'm saying, teach your children about novelty. It is the rarest gift. So we broke up that we broke the atom. We're like, okay, let's see, let's open the hood and see what's uh, how this engine works, <laughs> how the engine of matter works. And we saw that in some sense there was, for example, the relationship of the electron and the proton and the neutron. And I don't know how many people know this, but did you know? I want you to imagine your car, and I want you to imagine that same car that you have, let's say, as a person. One, any object, whatever object, just imagine some object. Now I want you to imagine 1,800 times bigger than that object. Okay? So the relationship of an electron with like a proton, the proton-neutron, is 1,800 times. The electron is smaller. Do you see? <clears throat> so there's this constant like... The skeleton of a single world is the simultaneity of the small and the big, the macro and the micro. You see, we are like fractals that became conscious, you know, not just organisms. <laughs> For me, life has kind of been this uh, strange game. I can tell you that if somebody tells, you know, asks me like, all right, all right, how do you see this life, you know? I'd say it's, it's a game in the sense that there is ver various different variables that appear. And for example, when you think about, when you look in front of your eyes and you want to move in front of your eyes, the variables are some, they're mainly more fixed and less evocational, but because it's an infusion of the two, behind your eyes, the variables are unknown. That means behind my eyes, I've, I've even like, <clears throat> how can I say it? Like, I don't know how many people have experienced this, what I'm going to say right now, but I've had moments where mid-walking, I'm just walking, just somewhere, you know, and mid-walking, there comes this feeling and the feeling is so, 
I don't want to give it a quality, but there's this unique feeling and it feels like attention. It literally feels like if an if you were watching an ant and the ant was like, yo, is something looking at me right now? <laughs> You know, I, I thought about something hilarious, guys, one day, one day. <laughs> I thought about, like, you know how if an ant, if, like, let's say you're, you're like, you're, you see a bird on a tree, and the bird suddenly, imagine it talks. Okay, you would be like, whoa, is this bird talking to me? Or let, let's say you see an ant, and you're like, yo, is this ant talking to me? <laughs> and so you, we would get scared, like, shocked. We would get shocked, and I feel if man is an ant to the higher worlds, but he acknowledges the, uh, any sort of higher plane, it will cause a shock factor. I feel God is shocked that man uh, considered a position. Now for me, I, I have this kind of view that language can't contain truth. It doesn't mean language is not true. It just means it cannot contain the truth of a changing world unless the language has come from a state beyond time. That means, did you know when you write, when you speak, you can speak with a consideration of time being linear or with a consideration that the moment is the only moment? You know, sometimes when I come to these talks, there's certain ideas, it's like I'm walking in my inner realms. And kind of how you walk in your inner realms, it's literally how your attention moves before your body does. Right now, my attention can move through the body. If I want to see what's behind me, my attention is moving through the body. But I could hold my body still and there could still be something that moves. That means if you can close your eyes and just sit still and silent for a while and ask yourself what is moving when my body isn't. Most people don't realize but I tested it out and I think this is one of the most, I, I felt it was a good way to test it. Pretty much I started saying it, like literally how I give these talks. I remember I tried it once. I, I got this micro sensitivity to my throat and my voice box. That means I was suddenly waiting. I was like, wait a minute. I'm, when I'm thinking, is my voice box micro moving? And I tested it out. And this is how I tested it out. I, I started saying a sentence. Let's say whatever. Let's say you say A, B, C, D. And then I was like, A, B, C, D. And then I was like, A, B, C, D. And then I was like, A, B, C, D. And then I was like, and then to a point where literally there was no sound coming, but the throat was moving. And I noticed that we don't realize how sophisticated our voice box, our voice box is, is connected to the brain. It is incredible. I feel when a person is asleep and they dream, and in that dream, something, they, they are feeling like they're communicating with something in their dream state. Like they'd say they're talking to some, some figure in their dream or they're moving in their dream. <clears throat> I feel that is uh, literally in, in reality, the person on the bed, even though he's talking in the dream, I feel the voice box is micro moving. That means that ABCD that I kept saying at a lower volume and eventually it reaches a point where the volume is so low you can't separate the, the, the saying with thinking. Do you know that means it's like, I don't know how clear that example was, but you can kind of try it out. It's like, let's do it with numbers. Let's say one, two, three, four, five. And then start saying this at a lower volume, lower volume, lower volume. Eventually, you will reach a point where your mouth is open, but there's no sound. And then eventually, you reach a point where your mouth can close and you're still saying it. So for me, I feel what is thought. Thought is literally how your mind, whatever happens to your body, is still moving. Your mind's life doesn't stop. Your body's life does at some point. So this is why the mind and the body must find the greatest allegiance. You must just suddenly open your eyes and see what are you waiting for? Who are you waiting for? Who can you wait for? You know?
<clears throat> there's been days where I've kind of looked at the sky and wondered when my saviors will come, you know? And then the next day I woke up and I realized the situation didn't need a savior. I was, I was good. <laughs> you know? So it's, it's momentary. A lot of our ideology is in the moment. I think we're such multidimensional beings that we're all conscious the universe is changing and that's why we're compassionate. We empathize with the fact that we change. And when anybody can change, who are you discriminating? Sometimes I look at, the, the, uh, uh, for example, racist ideology and we see this because, for example, <clears throat> I don't know how to say it, but like, we are still reacting to color. Like, I, I don't get it, guys. Like, I don't understand. Uh, this, is, this may sound intense, but I don't understand racism. And let me tell you what I, what I mean by that. <clears throat> I don't understand how a person can dislike color. I don't understand. I don't understand how it, it, it how the person's like uh, you know it's insane. How many objects are endless, numerous colors? You know, it's like just because like you know my bed sheets are blue, I don't go burning them. You know what I mean? It's, it's insane. It's insane that how human beings have identified while they have been changing and growing in life. In a growing system, we have identified with masks that have given us permission to break other people's masks. Like I'm telling you, uh, we are such, we're a fax machine civilization. We are still obsessed with the self. We are still looking for what we want. We still have not asked what the future generations want. And we will break. We will break unless we ask that question. After some point, you're like, it's light in our eyes. Are we just judging light in our eyes from the beginning to land? It's, it's, it's poetically chaotic. There's been moments in my inner realms where I literally felt the world knocked me out. It knocked, it knocked out my uh, existential morality through a new experience. But the cool thing about life is, is that whether it takes you to the extremes of order, whether it takes you to the extremes of chaos, if you don't fear intelligence, if you don't fear the presence of your attention, what happens is the full confrontation of the fear is a realization that the extreme of the fear is inconceivable. So what does that mean? There was never fear, there were just more levels to the world. <clears throat> I ask myself, who am I when I speak? I asked myself, who am I when I watch the image? Like, there came a time where I closed my eyes, guys, and I'm, I started imagining the scenery. I was, I was imagining light, light on, like, a, 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 a land, like on a field, in my mind. So I, I'm closed, my eyes are closed. Literally, no light is entering my eyes. But in that pitch black abyss, I'm seeing an image. And it's this kind of realization that we need light to get a basic uh, foundational image. Uh, uh, but then when we close our eyes, we still can have that image echo. So the mind, you know, like when I close my eyes and I imagine light, how can I see that light in my imagination? How can I see that light? Do you see? So seeing doesn't have to do with only the eyes if you can close your eyes and still visualize. So that means our eyes are more than the sensory. And if our eyes are more than the sensory, that could suggest that either the self is multidimensional or the world is multidimensional or what I like to call the best po possible option, both the world and the self are multidimensional and we have feared it. Right now, we are at a point in history where it's hilarious. We're not fearing the world becoming multidimensional. You know, we are fearing the self becoming multidimensional. And that's the beautiful thing. That's how traveling is going to be a myth. 
in the future. The fact that there were travelers is going to be a myth with the emergence of a recognition that energy is present as a field before its particles moving in that field. <clears throat> this world is incredibly complex. Look at this, like, I don't know, kid, cat kid in the wallpaper picture. I don't know who drew this, but the artist is nice. Whoever knows the artist, write his name in the chat section so I can, or comment section, and I'm going to find the guy's name. But I'm, I'm telling you, this, this artwork was incredible for me because I have had many moments where I have been alone and I have been staring at civilization. Do you know? It's like you don't know how many silent walkers there are in this world, how many silent travelers that the world never sees. For every one person that we hear, do you know how many voices we don't hear? Do you know with every person you help, how many people you they're still left? It's messed up. It's messed up that the world is has become conscious after four billion years of evolution. We have become conscious, and rather than moving towards peace, we have been more still breaking each other into pieces. Right now, it's, it's very funny. It's like the human being has an instant ability. The reality is abstract. The concept of yourself, if somebody comes up to you and says, like, hey man, you got an ego, and you'd be like, yeah, I got an ego. <laughs> and then you'd be like, put your ego on the table. And you can't. You cannot put the idea, the subject that you think you are for your objective experience is not an object. And here's the dangerous thing. It's the evolution in the way we're defining the, the experience of a subject. If the experience is distant, our inner realms are defining it. If the experience is close, then you don't need the inner realms. It's, it's like, do you know what I mean? It's like, you, it's like once, think of it this way. Imagine you're do, um, completing a math exam. If you know what it is, you don't worry about the problem. Do you see? So on some level, there's no such thing as knowledge because everybody has their own DNA. Everybody has their own rare alphabet of all the experiences they've had and they are processing what is happening to them. And then we come to the similar language. So let me tell you, all knowledge is language. All knowledge. Just like you, met, you, you learn the alphabet, that's what history is. History is an alphabet of events. I remember I was uh, walking in the UK 2014, guys. These talks, this whole Mr. with an idea was kind of set into motion. <clears throat> and I was living in Birmingham, UK at the time. And Birmingham, UK, I would advise you, um, uh, anybody who goes there more than a week, stays there more than a week, you better have a good reason. <laughs> it's not per se the safest and the most best place. You know, there's... There's savageness and morality due to ideological differences, you know. So I remember when I was in the UK and I was, I, I was in Birmingham, I would give these talks and I would walk around and kind of explore the city. And there were these kind of... Um, I'm just going to tell you what it was. It was there were these Somalian, for example, um, uh, like, I don't want to say gangs, but there were these Somalian groups that made the environment unsafe. You know, because human beings, they have different levels of savageness. Some people may not realize this, that it, it, um, even though uh, that we are becoming a globalized kind of world community, we're having people from all different kinds of nations going to different nations, you know, and so what does this mean? That means different levels of experiential intensity, right? That means it's like... Uh, it's like just like how a young child, it's, it's heavy for them to lift up an object, 
you know, but for that same child, when it grows up, it can lift that object. Similarly, it's the same for subjective experience. Your experiences suggest your familiarity. Your familiarity suggests your contentment. So behind all knowledge, there is a direct experiential level where knowing is, is being processed. <clears throat> it's not even being processed linearly. That means I was like, are you telling me, when I, was, when I studied Young, Carl Young, I was like, Young, are you telling me, <laughs> are you telling me that this whole time I've been thinking my consciousness is my life and there's the unconscious and that there's also, a, a, you know, of course, Carl, I don't think Carl Young used the term subconscious. I feel that um, our humanity is not a logical, it doesn't have logical meaning. It has a meaning only when it's active. There's some moments, guys, I will tell you where you shouldn't be afraid of your own ego vision. Now, ego vision is a concept. <laughs> Where it was, I I noticed it was like the idea was there in the in like this this film called Assassin's Creed, and it's also a game. It seems, you know. So this this idea of eagle vision was like literally the guy would go on top of a tower like Batman in this in this kind of uh, cyber cyber game, digital game. Uh, Assassin's Creed, the main character, goes on top of a building and then jumps like an eagle into a stack of hay, you know, and so, but the way I was using the term eagle vision, I was literally using it in a natural way, I was using it like the vision of an actual eagle on the branch compared to when it's flying in the sky and it sees knowledge and that's what uh, you know, what Suvithin is trying to do here, I'm trying to tell you that you can be the, the eagle of your own mind, you can look at all phenomena as your whole moment. That's the ego being in the sky. That's why I say your mind is as endless as the sky. Or you can be like the ego on a certain branch of knowledge. Just like how you can enter a room, you can enter an identification with how the environment is moving. And so there were certain shamans, and it, I, I, I don't know how to say this, but I could tell you from... Uh, the poetry of the eyes of another life that some people spoke to the world and they did not speak to it through the la through an alphabet of through a language the language the world speaks to the shaman through events through events that's why the those who suddenly are noticing the Jungian synchronicity of, I don't know, the dude looks at the clock and he's like, you tell me it's 555 five, five right now? <laughs> really what that is, is it's the synchronization. It's when your inner realms trust the outer realms. A civilization that keeps human beings from uh, allowing their inner realms to externalize is a civilization that wants the human being to just be, uh, it's the efforts of the human being be, be just behind the eyes. You see, it's not that people need ability or power. Anyone who wants power has not wondered about the power that already exists in the world. I have experienced certain things in nature where I felt it was like my whole moment of being communicating to me. I'll share a personal experience. It, it happened in UK Birmingham. I reached the point where I had mismanaged my uh, finances and I was in this situation where I hadn't eaten for three days. And what happens when you don't eat 
It was actually a great insight into human psychology, you know. After, when you don't eat for three days, what happens is your body temperature just reduces, reduces, reduces. So it's like as the less you eat, the more the cold uh, uh, you feel, you, the easier you get cold. So after the third day, and of course, you know, it was like I, I was drinking water, but there was nothing else. And then it was this kind of situation where after the third day, it was literally the body had stopped wanting food after the third day and there was automatic moments where I would kind of feel like just I can't do anything and I remember I, I had this experience where um, you know my brother was in a other side of the university um, and I had no choice I was kind of going there to see him and the situation was that I was I was sitting in Aspen University in Birmingham there is this um, pond, there is this pond, and there is this tree in front of this pond, and I remember I went and sat there, and it was such a hilarious situation, because even my phone battery had died, and I was just sitting there. I remember I sat beside that tree, like the tree. There was no hu human dimension active when there was no allowance for that human dimension to grow. And I was just sitting, staring at this pond. I was like a meter away. The pond was so interesting, the way it was designed. It had all these large grass uh, around it, but there was one part of it that didn't. Not one part of it, but there was a part of it that didn't. And I remember I went and sat in front where the pond was literally like, I don't know, half a meter away from me, the, where the water began. And I was just staring at the water of the pond. And there was like this family of ducks just swimming, you know, in the thing, in the pond. And I'm just staring. And I remember I'm just there watching and I found a contentment that sometimes in life when you get what, 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 when you get what you want, the system keeps getting momentum. But sometimes when you don't get what you want, the system kind of reaches a sort of... When you don't get what you want, you you just watch. You're left as the watcher. And the watcher after attempts at emotion and movement of object and so, so when you can when you can't move the object any further, when you can't move the subject any further, and even the emotions can't move the object and subject any further, then it's like you just remain as the watcher. And that was the experience I had. And there was suddenly this moment, not suddenly, but there was just this silence. Now, here's the thing, here's what I mean when my moment was speaking to me, how I felt my moment of being was speaking to me. Guys, I was sitting there and from behind me, this bird flies, <coughs> this sparrow. It flies from behind me and literally goes sits on an empty bench. So literally, I'm just sitting there, I notice this bird fly from behind me, my eyes like like a laser beam, imagine, like it was following the bird, and I saw the bird go sit on an empty bench. And then there was this instant feeling in me, go and sit on that bench. So I saw this sparrow fly from behind me. I was sitting on the grass, cross leg, and then I saw, I saw the sparrow fly from above, from behind me and above my head, and it went and sat, and literally the sparrow landed on a bench, and I just trusted that moment and I just went. I literally got up and went on the bench. After literally I had gone two meters, the whole family of ducks stepped out of the pond exactly from where I was sitting, as if I was blocking their way. And I remember that was a moment where I was in internally crying. Not externally. Externally after a point, you're like, why waste the moisture of the face? You just internally cry after a while, you know? It's okay to release the emotions. It's okay to be a, po be a poet in a poetic universe. But I'm, I'm telling you, there's moments where some emotions, it's healthy to express them. Some emotions, when you express them, you dishonor yourself. So the human being has to realize that you are a performer in your own eyes. You are the performance of your eyes, literally. <laughs> A slow hand clap for all these eyes performing in this world, guys. <laughs>
I feel it's an evolutionary return to a natural decency where the problem was not dualistic, so reality was just experiential and existential. Sometimes when I look at any challenge, anything someone says, I, I, I anything. Uh, first, the first thing I'm, okay, here's the thing. These are kind of Mr. Withens. Like I was thinking of designing this course on advanced communication, but I'll, I'll tell you this. People don't speak through words. Words are the effect. What's causing language is uh, an inner film. And this inner film is kind of like this attributeless field like attention witnessing movement. It's a micro sensitivity to movement, and that micro sensitivity towards movement makes you associate with stillness. So we think right now we are just the biological body, but we don't realize we're not the body because this body, like a candle, is illuminating the whole room. So the mind kind of feels like the world to us. Your world and your mind feel like simultaneous, do they not? So that's why you can't put the mind on the table because it is your whole moment. Now I'm saying there will come times in life if you're not ideologically obsessed where you will suddenly see it's just being here. There's this poem by this poet named Jalaluddin Maulana Rumi. 700 years ago, the Sufi mystic poet said, I died as a mineral. I died as a mineral. And I became a plant. I died as a plant. And I rose to animal. I died as an animal. And I was mad. Why should I fear death? When was I less by dying? I shall die once more to soar with angels bless. But even from angelhood, I must pass on to that which no mind has ever conceived. We are evolving towards the inconceivable as individual object and conceivable subjects. We are not just the dance of matter in space and we're not just the space moving the matter. We are the rare moment in, that, in the cosmos where Imagine this, everything has been happening. All these people running towards oneness and unity. Let me tell you, for eons it has been united. For eons it was just one unconscious event. And it was only when we went through a phase of an objective evolution where nature was like, all right, I'm going to have this a part of me have legs and walk over me. And nature... <laughs> and so what happened was we were designed to walk on this earth. We were designed to be separate by earth. It's as if the earth wanted us to go uh, like a bird, fly out of the nest of unconscious movement. And so your consciousness is your greatest ability. How you are conscious, it's like what else can your divinity be? Where can it be? Ask yourself, if life was an illusion, where is the illusion? And ask yourself if life was true, where is the truth? And you will see, man, our species should not fear the inconceivable. It should not fear the unknown because evolution is the entrance into it. I feel we are, there is no such thing as, uh, this might be a bold statement, but I think the educational system made a decision. It made a decision that it wants soldiers rather than it wants explorers. But it wants economical soldiers. Like, think about it, guys. 
Imagine you're a country. Imagine you're a country at war. Imagine you're a country at war and you're like, what, what should the curriculum of the educational system be? And you'd kind of be like, all right, we need soldiers. And the, imagine the educational system was set from a time that it was, it was before telecommunications was properly there. It was Morse code. So people had to memorize everything in a bunker, all the information, and run to another bunker in the middle of the battlefield to relay the, the exact information. By the way, welcome everyone in the chat section. My attention is there. Anytime anybody has a question from me, uh, just put MW and ask your question and I'll respond to it immediately. I have this theory, guys, or rather this approach, this view from this inner ivory tower. And I feel there was idol worship, there was object worship, human beings looked at objects and were like, yo, this object is God. This object is the only truth because my attention is on the object. And it was as if the object, the idols were slapped out of man's hand as if people came and said, don't worship an object, you kidding me? Then what happened is, what happens when we stop worshipping idols? Do we stop worshipping, you think the worship has stopped? No, we started worshipping language. And we're a civilization that has been idolizing language, idolizing words. Truth was first thought to be an object. Then truth became a subject. Truth became revelation from the void. Truth became theories from the void. Truth became the langu became language. And now, I feel, in 2020, we have reached the end of the era of language worship, and we have, after 2020, I declared this, that we have moved on to the era of advanced communication. That means we have realized that we are, we don't even, it's as if the subjects are being pushed out of our, slapped out of our hands, and we're like, Yo, what else is there left to worship if it's, there's no object and subject to worship? You realize the concept of worship dissolves into pure attention. And there you are where you have always been. Energy, simply, or simple energy, aware of itself through complexity. You let your mind be at ease. You salute your own intelligence for the effort of its continuity so far. <clears throat> this might be a strange idea, but I salute uh, literally every cell of my biological existence before I sleep. Not before I sleep, but there's moments where throughout the day I just... It's kind of like you bow to the moment as if I see you, world. I see you. I see you today.
Guys, I'm going to do something incredible that I think perhaps hasn't been done in podcast history, or maybe I'm not aware it has been done. But I'm going to try it out here. Um, I'm going to give the audience, because we got a bigger audience today, I'm going to give three options. And <laughs> people can choose which route they, they, which, which route they want the talk to go. Um, okay, so John, give me a second. Let me just write the third option and then I'll respond. <laughs> All right, let's see. What were the avenues I wanted to take this talk? There, there was a science fiction. We, we could see the future of the talk. We could see the past. Or I would say the unknown present. So the audience can choose out of these three. The unknown route will be something completely new. The other two would be new, still new ideas on those two areas. What, so people can choose between one to three. You know, I'm literally <laughs> allowing the audience to choose the destiny of this talk. Okay. <laughs> So guys, John John Moss in the ch chat sex chat section says, um, "Watch out for art." Craig used to say, "As soon as they start doing art, we're in trouble." Symbolic thinking of any kind would signal downfall. Craig's view lit in a mop, but that will have to wait. Next, they'd be minting idols and funerals and grave goods, and the afterlife and sin and linear being and kings and then slavery or snowman longs to question them who first had the idea of making reasonable fa fa facsimile of him of snowman average or what, what does that mean oh an exact copy of him okay <clears throat> idea of making a re re so I would say this. <clears throat> so John, I would say this. Here's the thing. It's not that Craig was taking it too far. I think Craig perhaps maybe was an empiricist. I'm not that familiar with his work, but he seems to be an empiricist. What does that mean? That means he feels that the movement of any sort of the movement of thought. I what I said. Look. I don't think anything is a mistake. I think every moment you could look at a phenomena and perceive it in accordance to time as if having moved from the past to the present or from the future to the present. So, so what I mean by that is that I don't think humanity has made mistakes. I think it just hasn't made better decisions. You know, I don't, I don't think anything that's happened so far, I think if all our ancestors were alive and watching, they'd be like, all right, definitely our grandkids, you know, lived in, in new ways beyond our imagination. That's really what you want. You want the future generations to go beyond what you can imagine. <clears throat> so guys, people have chosen number three. If you notice, the options were chosen in accordance to time. So future past and present so the unknown route would be the ideas coming back to now exactly now let's see
Sorry guys, I haven't ate breakfast. If you hear extra noises, just assume it's the stomach of the birds outside grumbling. <laughs> Let me see what feels unknown. Let me see what the unknown dimension of a world made of smaller worlds would be. The unknown dimension would be literally us moving beyond the concept of a self and a world and entering a new space where we either create a new relationship through a new language that as an acknowledgement for our dimensions of consciousness. What does that mean? That means we need to first... Where's my pen? <coughs> we need to... Um, We need to study the system. Then we need to study ourselves in the system. Then we have to study <clears throat> the unknown dimensions of the system. And the unknown dimensions is technically a new system or outside of the previous system. So life is not meant for us to get our desires. In the approach of our desires, we, we become the new, I think. Silence kills time. I'm going to share with you an unknown experience I've kind of had in my inner realms. There was a time where I remember I was, uh, it, this, this was the whole inspiration for the first book I ever wrote, uh, which was called The Great Work, and it was a very strange book. <coughs> um, what I'm probably going to give it like you know put it for free for people to see what it's like anyways it's a strange book and the way it was inspired was I was at my table literally just at, uh, what do you call it fixing paper like you know organizing paperwork on my table and instantly I get this vision of this meteor in space this meteor in space and my attention inconceivably is witnessing that moment. That means I'm witnessing the moment, but not as a, as a material form in that moment. And I'm witnessing this moment where there's this kind of giant asteroid in my mind's, in my, in my inner realm's conception of space, this asteroid in space, and I know instantly this asteroid has groups of souls in it. And suddenly, this asteroid in that inner vision I was having breaks. And then, I suddenly noticed that as if space has a soul, the only thing I hadn't considered, I'd considered a, a sort of, uh, I'd considered uh, a, there being just matter, a materialist perspective. Then I was like, okay, what happens when I get, when I, when I imagine if it was just materialistic for eons and we were wondering then about something more. So then I, I kind of realized, all right, so it's like I'm just the body, the body's the whole projection or the mind is projecting, the body's projecting the mind and the body mind is reprojecting the body. Then I thought in some sense, the mind and the body are separate dimensions. But then they reached a point where I realized the unknown appears to me as empty as space. It's not a conceivable knowing. I feel there are higher dimensions in this world of ours, but you can't access them as a concept. You can't, you can't remain as a concept. So it was like, I, I saw a body, I saw a soul in the body, I saw the body 
<clears throat> in some sense, in the soul. But I'm saying at the same time, the self and the world, when they are witnessed to be inseparable, you are not, you, you realize you can't be a concept. You can perceive a concept, but you're, the, what you perceive is not the totality of what you are. All right, guys, so an interesting question uh, in the chat section. Kaylee says, Mr. Within, what advice can you give me as to exploring inner realm, stretching my reality, testing the capacity, and testing the capacity and maybe you were writing excellence or something. My message cut off, but I think you get, yeah. Here's the thing. You gotta, before studying the inner realms, come to a contentment with your outer realms. And you won't find a contentment with your outer realms until you are comfortable to see emptiness. So you can't be comfortable with matter unless you're also comfortable with the codependent side of it, just like dark day and night, you gotta kinda, you gotta master certain dualities, then your inner realms automatically open up to you. You don't have, there's no technique on some level because consciousness is conditional. That means if you want like an instruction, you can only apply that instruction in your conscious waking state. But if you go through an explorative, explorative approach where you're like, all right, I'm alive as a being, let's see what this mind is, and nobody has my eyes, so I'm the only one who can really pursue their, uh, figure out this instrument of existence, instrumentation of existence. I'm telling you, you will, there will come a day where you will be so fascinated by how unknown you are to yourself that your attention will instantly go to your own intelligence. When your attention instantly goes on to your own intelligence, you realize the inner life is how you've analyze the outer life. The outer life is how, in some sense, you have accepted the inner life. So, uh, so there are certain dualities. Think of it this way. Back in the day, the concept of an elementalist, someone who in some sense was able, like just they realized their body was made of elements and they realized their mind is how the world is being elemental. And so in that instant, they found an inseparability so the person could lift their hands and oceans could suddenly uh, lift into the sky. You know, and so it would be a situation, uh, I'm, I'm being poetic here, but, but what I mean is, is that we, um, here's the thing, people usually go towards spirituality because they suffer physically and they wonder what it all means and they realize they're having a narrative approach with physical reality. So they start having a narrative uh, uh, approach and relationship with non-physical reality. That means we tell our, we put stories in everything. We put stories in objects, we put stories in people, we put stories even in empty space. The Big Bang is a story that emerged out of empty space, you know? So on some level, we, you, it's like studying your relation, studying, here's the thing, it might sound hilarious, but the most spiritual thing a person can do is study matter. <laughs> do you know? Study, study your outer realms. And literally notice, uh, this is the best thing I can say, guys. Just notice throughout the day when you wake up, the meaning of the moment, is it coming from inside or outside? Is it coming from in front of your eyes or is it coming from behind your eyes? When you can notice that and when you can, wa when you're, when you can watch how you experience your own existence throughout the day, there is no more advice needed because it's no longer a relationship where you need instructions. You're realizing reality is like the weather. Your inner realms are like the weather. Sometimes it's raining. Sometimes, so you are the pilot. 
in the sense of you are the response to whatever your senses appear as. So I'm saying study the objective realm and study language, which is studying how your subjective realm is, is a conditioned sculpture of how your parents spoon-fed you and how the world spoon-fed you and after some point how you started holding the spoon and you started spoon-feeding yourself. So you have to realize this. You have to notice how much are you a creature of language, how much are you a creature of society, how much are you a creature that can do something new. Do you see what I mean? That means think about it. Imagine there's a person and the, everybody goes to that person and says, I'll tell you a story. Perfect story. There's a story that can share this point better than I can. Sometimes truth is a paradox. Sometimes truth is the paradox, you know? <laughs> I feel that life is not like... Um, you can't have an instruction booklet on it. It's like horse It's like horse riding. Literally, somebody could come and explain and give you whatever amount of images. It feels like this riding a horse. You got to do this when you ride a horse. But when you see that horse, it's a living being. And you got to just put your hand on the horse and see if the horse is comfortable with your presence. Animals are like this. Animals, you, you are the superior species. Do you know there was something I saw, guys, it, it, it broke me, like literally, let me tell you, the internet, you, you can see, find some videos that build you, but you can also see some videos that break you as a human being, and it's your own discretion and nature that leads you towards what you see. Do you know? So the story I wanted to share is the story about... Uh, Let's call the story Frog Will, okay? These two frogs fall into this ditch or this hole or something and they can't get out. All the frogs and Frog Will gather around and these frogs and Frog Will, they're not nice frogs. These frogs are like, yo, you guys will never get out of this hole. You know, they're all showing, showering these two with hate. And constant, constant, as if usually you expect your civilization to energize you, but you imagine the civilization is de-energizing you. Now check this out. All these frogs gather around these holes where these two frogs are trying to jump out of, and they're constantly negativity hate. You know, it's like you can't do a dead frog walking, you know. <laughs> like all this stuff. You know, all this, all this uh, resistance. Now, what you see is both frogs are trying to jump, trying to jump. One of the frogs suddenly stops. It gives up. It lets go of its hope. And it goes to a corner. It closes its eyes. And it goes to sleep and dies. It, it, the, one of the frogs gives up. But the other frog, strangely, the, the more hatred... The more intense the frog looks up and sees all these people shouting and saying, you can't, you can't, you can't, you know, this frog, instead of getting less energized, it's getting incredibly energized. And suddenly, and all the frogs are like, yo, we're insulting this guy. He's getting more energized. He's getting like more power to jump out. How's this possible? Suddenly, the frog jumps out and all the frogs are like, yo, he's the chosen one. <laughs> Like Neo in the Matrix moment, you know, the frog jumps out. And then people realize that frog was deaf. And not that that frog was actually deaf. That frog was deaf to inefficiency. That frog couldn't hear inefficiency. And so what it means is the frog saw all those people shouting and didn't see them shouting. The frog that was dead thought they were cheering for him. So your inner realms, it's up to you how high you aim. But your outer realms, you must walk with your world as far as it has gone. So your outer realms, you must kind of be a superior being behind your eyes. And be, you must, here's the thing. 
it's like back in the day, people of a certain swords, uh, imperial, like certain swordsmen, they would have their sword, sword masters, they would have their sword, but they would not use it. They would only use it at the presence of other mastery. That means a incredibly skilled person holds back the skill like a sword only when there is someone of the same skill level. They they bring the sword, and you see this in uh, uh, the spirit of rhetoric throughout history. You know that when man realized how advanced his mind is, the mind was the game changer. The mind was the game ch changer where it was suddenly intelligence. It was about information. To be honest, all knowledge is what information means to you. And what information collectively can be agreed upon. So I would say it's just kind of you realizing nobody has your DNA, nobody has your eyes. It's self-inquiry. And self-inquiry means you're used to identifying with the self through states of movement and noise, through speech and intense movement. I don't know how many people uh, on this planet uh, throughout their lifetime just find a moment to sit and watch. You're in this random film. We're on a rock in the middle of nowhere. We're in a sphere on a vacuum wearing watches. It's scary, guys, but fascinating at the same time. And so really I asked myself, what am I left to do? And I look at, I remember there was a time I was wondering, what's the purpose of my life? Very poetic, kind of emotional moment, you know? I'm like, what is this purpose, you know? There's times, guys, I, whenever I go through an intense defeat or some intense thing suddenly happens, and pretty much for me, I don't blame anything outside of myself simply because, when I say I don't blame, I mean, it, it's not that I don't hold the external world responsible for its constitution. I, 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 I'm just saying that there's moments where I don't know how many people have felt empty in a world where there's only existence. In a world that is filled, we feel empty. In a, in a planet with 8 billion people, one in three people in Japan is dying out of loneliness in their building. It's intense. And I'm wondering why. It's because the educational system trained soldiers. It did not train uh, advanced communicators. We think our education comes from just seeing the image. No, you have to draw it. There's no greater way than to explore for yourself. I'm telling you, you can't remember anything if you are using an outer method. You have to find the first your... Here's the thing I say, you gotta find an honest world to live in and then your true life begins happening. When your true life begins happening, because you're not deviating from your nature, you trust it. Because you're not doing something that you feel resistant about, you in some sense trust your moment. When you trust the moment, the, your full intelligence applies. So I'm telling you, it's not that people are stupid or smart. There are people who trust what's happening, they, they look at what's happening and they trust the intelligence, and there are people who don't. And that's the thing, that's the tragedy, that it's the image fed to people. The mind has no class, the mind has no hierarchy, the mind is awareness. That means on some level, it doesn't matter how atoms move, we have to give them freedom. 
I was like, yo, I, I, this body is giving me freedom to be a conscious being. I'm going to give this body freedom. If the body wants to dismantle any moment, I, I, am, I, I have given it its freedom. Its freedom was not even up to me or me to decide. There's so many things in this life where it's literally storms you're w walking through. And it's like the winds become heavy and you lunge <laughs> to hold yourself in those winds. And after the winds finish, you can walk. And that's the only advice that you can give this, uh, this plane of existence. One, you're the pilot. And two, it's chaos and order. Those are the wings of the bird. That is the simulation of the cells flying in the world, you know? So that, that state, so Kaylee, I was just reading your comment. The last thing you said, I feel like I have no resistance to change anymore. That is, there, that state is presence you have been you have life has has opened your eyes to the presence of nature before the personality storytelling that presence if you abide by that and just let let the moment become like uh the revel revelation of the piano player you you'll suddenly see it uh, so what I'm saying is it's we think we have to find an ideological system that has to overall be true, not realizing the whole system is dynamic, it's moving, and it's kind, kind, kind of like endless piloting. You're at, you're, you're, the soul is a pilot, and it's hilarious because it's a field piloting the particles in it. This is why your mind is superior to matter. This is why you could look at an object and name it. It's like how aliens are going to look at human beings and be like, how adorable these creatures are, you know, naming objects. <laughs> Instead of realizing the nature of reality is that we evoke, we imbue the phenomena with meaning. So I am telling you, it's like, just keep your eyes open and the guy in mind will assist you. Don't, don't uh, uh, hold a blind eye to a system that can be updated. And the guy in mind will move you. I, I, I don't call it, I mean, the guy in mind, it's, the Gaia is a Greek term, okay? But I would say the winds of evolution. The winds of evolution. For me, divinity is really a sort of wind, you know? You, let me tell you, it's like this. It's like when you truly experience yourself through a non-dual moment, you won't have any more questions and answers because you see no one has ever had your eyes. Your eyes are the stargate you, your consciousness emerges through. You know, it's like, you know, it's like <clears throat> the person wrote on his resume, you know, the employer was like, to, looks at the employee, you know, to the guy who's come for the job interview, you know, the employer says, and he says, sir, can you explain to me, you know, your, your background, you know, your background experience, you know, your history. And then the employee looks at the employer, the, the person who's come for the job interview, and looks at the employer and says, yes, yes, um, you know, I have... 4 billion years of evolutionary experience, 250,000 years of uh, kind of s s experience of a genetical pattern through civilization. <laughs> you know, I'm also, like, if, you, if you're a religious person, then I am, um, I'm an inconceivable conception, you know. Like, so technically, I don't have a history if, if it's all God moving in the first place, if man was the illusion of the divine will or never existed. So then the, the employer is like, all right, man, I think we can't hire you for, <laughs> you know, because, you you know, the, the values of our company are different. <laughs> oh, man. I'm just trying to say that we are not just what we see. We are how the scythe is moving, and the mover is not is beyond the sensor. It's the it's like after the senses have been processed, there is something that observes that process that processed image of the senses, and then can respond to it. 
<clears throat> I would just say, just re just just listen to to the music of your own mind. I mean, just see how your mind is happening. Really, I'll, I'll, here I'll tell you the story. Shirin Sargnad Maharaj, this man was a cigarette salesman in India. And he was like this poor, very poor person who was just every day w w w waking up and going to a cigarette tobacco shop and selling t t uh, tobacco, right? And he was in Indian culture, and in Indian culture, they have this something that I, I, when I went there, I felt like, I kind of felt strangely like at peace, you know, because there was an acknowledgement of uh, the, the Atman, you know? There was an acknowledgement that uh, energy could be one intelligent phenomena before it is separate, whether it's in the form of one human or another. So, there, so anyways, Shirin Sargadat Maharaj, uh, one day a friend of his comes and says, hey man, there's this God-conscious person, let's go find him. Let's go talk to him, you know, like there's this guru. So Shirin Sargadat Maharaj goes to this, I don't remember the guru's name, some guy, in, in some guru and the guru looks at Srinya Sarkadat Maharaj in this humble, kind of simple, poor cigarette salesman, you know, uh, tobacco salesman. He, and, and in that moment, uh, what's his name? The guru looks at Srinya Sarkadat Maharaj and says, uh, what does he say? He says, study yourself every moment of your life. Study yourself. And Srinya Sargadat Maharaj just bows silently, kind of in awe, as if he's been told something he never, he never wondered about that deeply. And so after that, Srinya Sargadat Maharaj was no longer uh, a, a, just a person selling cigarettes. Even though he was living his normal life, he had also accessed an inner quest. And that inner quest was to really see how meaning is being generated for, uh, for you. For example, I'm a person who, I, uh, I, when I was younger, I didn't like reading. And then, and everybody would tell me, all right, man, slow down, read it, you know, slowly. And years later, I started just, just out of my own kind of maverick style of wondering about the opposite. I, I kind of like, at that moment, uh, what do I say? I started re attempting to read a book as fast as I could. I was like, all right, let me just attempt to read a chapter and see what image was painted in my mind. And I was shocked that when I started reading faster, I started seeing a film literally projecting the wall of my inner realms. So I realized like it was, it was like the environment didn't even know what it was talking about. How could the world know? It is too big to know. <laughs> so we're not, our point, I'm not here saying, guys, all right, we're going to do this and we're going to know everything. No, it's a dynamic system. It's a river that goes on, it changes, it evolves. Uh, back in the day, you know, right now in today's society, if you wear a top hat, you know, it's uncommon, it's strange. But back in the day, if you didn't wear a top hat, you'd be like, you know, you, wouldn't, you weren't even considered human. Right? So human beings have had weird relationships, you know, it's, it has been ideological oriented. Why? Because we don't just need houses to live in, we need stories to feel we are being part of something and we're existing. Most people I've noticed, especially in, 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 in the Western, uh, I would say, uh, in the modern world, I think relationships are being based on accepting each other's illusion for what it is rather than realizing it is okay for there to be many mountains of truth. Okay? That means every mountain has its own peak. And in some sense, every human being has a sort of, I, I would say, invisible landscape of how the language they have opened their eyes through has classified intelligence for them. So the unknown, when I say the unknown route here, it is literally wondering about the edge of conception and the edge of conception, because conception is in duality, it is either uh, th through the singular void, you know, you know, or it is through infinity.
There are literally, these are the only ways. These are the only ways. This is the only way you can come out of duality. And language is a simulation, is a technology occurring in, through duality. I don't know. I feel the greatest teaching of life is that it is neither the object, it is neither the subject, it is how the whole moment is being alive. I feel right now me thinking I exist and me thinking, uh, like, like right now me thinking uh, all these objects are separate. On some level I feel uh, before thought the mind was being something. It was being intelligence before the shape of intelligence could be acknowledged. So we were intelligent before we could even measure the intelligence. Even measure, like it's hilarious, you know, it's like, guys, check this out. Let's say we want to measure intelligence. So that measurement is limited to the measurer and it is limited to the one being measured. So the measurer's intelligence is suggesting the intelligence of the other. So there is technically no such thing as uh, measurable intelligence where all different eyes are perceiving a different dimension of the earth. And in this life, you can choose to share your inner realms with your world or you can choose not to. They're both options. I'm trying to get this renaissance of massive communication going. I was thinking like, let's say, let's say there's a 50% chance that there's aliens and there's aliens uh, looking at us from the atmosphere through stealth technology or through invisible dimensions, I don't know. Somehow, let's say it's a coin flip, it's 50-50. Now, let's say the aliens are watching. Let's say right now, instead of Fermi was like, where are the aliens? <laughs> instead of Fermi's paradox, imagine if, if there were aliens, but we could not see them. We knew, we knew we were being watched. We knew just like we look at the ant, there's something looking at the human being. Now, I was thinking, if I was looking at the human being from a distance, from an aerial view, imagine every person listening right now, imagine you were 200 meters in the air and looking at just the earth. Imagine in the future jetpacks become so common, like everybody has a jetpack. Your phone becomes a jetpack. I don't know. <laughs> you open up the jetpack app of your phone and your phone becomes a jetpack. I don't know. <laughs> If you were looking at the earth from an aerial view, it is only the activity of these human beings that is suggesting their intelligence. That means the extraterrestrial is judging us based on our actions, but we are judging ourselves based on our own beliefs. If we can step out of the ethnocentric, if we can step out of our inner realms, we will notice an outer realm. And let me tell you, it's this strange thing where some people may not believe it, but we have to, it's like first you got to get into heaven and then from heaven we go and handle hell. And what does that mean? That means the empire of the paradise of the inner realms extends. I want you to kind of hilariously think the edge of the peak of selfishness, the peak of egotism. The person's like, I am so powerful. I am so powerful. Imagine right now, there's this one person who's, who is like this ruthless Genghis Khan kind of leader. And imagine this Genghis Khan kind of leader, uh, let's call this conquer a time, and this conquer time conquered the world. <clears throat> if aliens attacked that conquer, would be ego is good for defense. You know, I'm just telling, I'm just saying that I feel the skill of people 
is available in their inner realms, but in their outer realms, we have to create opportunities. I actually think we need a, a civilization that uh, its governmental organization in the future becomes the ultimate resource station. It is only through giving that you change life. That means you got to give some effort, you know. Even if you want to water plants, the gardener has to make an effort. You see, so effort is the most basic thing. Now imagine you master effort by just being in the moment and being like, all right, I'll let the unknown speak first. And when the unknown speaks first, you are not a creature of thought. I would say, Kaylee, I would recommend you buy a notebook <clears throat> and start having this kind of relationship. I think uh, metaphysics, you don't need to jump into esotericism, metaphysics, or even too, too ritual, too instructional of meditation. Okay, those are good maybe if they help you, but I, I'm not recommending that. I'm just saying my, my kind of technique is utmost through writing. And I'm telling you, just get a notebook or a journal and just always have a pen by you. <clears throat> Back in the day, people had swords with them, you know. So nowadays, I think every human being should have a pen, you know. For me, a pen is like my, like I always have one with me, right? Why? Because I don't know when. I don't know when an idea will come that is so important, I cannot let that idea uh leave. So you then start writing it down and after a couple times, I would say definitely after 10 times of experiencing moments where such a unique new idea appears to your own self in that kind of still abiding state, after a couple times of writing it, you begin realizing that novelty is a vehicle. Because it changes the location of meaning. It changes how meaning was first local and it becomes multi-local. And so it's incredible because it's dimensions. Uh, we are evolving from one dimension to another dimension. And then it's becoming so many evolution of dim dimensions that the being is forgetting the previous. So I think at most we are aware of three dimensions of our evolution. Where our past, our present and our future. And so the past, you've already seen it, it's known. The future, you can't know it, you can visualize it, the visualizations of it could be known. It is only the here and now and the present where the true unknown is standing. And only in a sort of, sorry guys, I'm, I think I should go eat breakfast. <laughs> Guys, before my stomach takes over the talk, I'm <laughs> Just to end the talk, guys, the world is made of many more worlds. We thought we had to be one thing, but in life you're not just an image, you are the processor of the imagery. And so when you study your own senses, what greater teacher can you find? In Sri Nisargadot Maharaj, he says this thing where he says, when I see that I am nothing, that is wisdom. When I see that I am everything, that is love. And in between, my life moves. So when you notice that in between, Aldous Huxley also points to that in between state. Aldous Huxley says there's things known and things unknown and in between are the doors of perception. So Shri and Sargadad Maharaj and Aldous Huxley both came to the doors of perception. 
<clears throat> when you remain in the doors of your own perception, you begin learning not just from order and chaos, but how they are codependent and how to every chaos there is an order and how to every order there is a chaos. Because again, as Rumi says, a bird needs two wings to fly. Your mind needs chaos in order to exist as a dynamic character with unknown variables. So anyways, guys, I hope this talk was uh, helpful, and let me just see if I did justice to the subtitle, yeah. All right, guys, have a good day, and uh, thanks for tuning in. Much blessings and else. Find a freedom that was there before the concept of freedom. Much blessings and awesome.